in the 21st century Hard-working people Working hard for you and me Moving higher Time and time again Through the years you'll find us here Moving higher Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Markets. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Dawson Tire and Will, your premier ag tire and wheel provider in North America, helping people grow. Tractor Zoom delivering insights and dry shod boots, the official work boot of the Moving Iron Podcast. On this edition, I have Sean Hackett back here, and Sean is with Hackett Financial out of Boca Raton, Florida. And Sean, how you doing this morning, man? Doing really good. I want you to know that our first cool front of the year is expected next Uh-oh. week. And it's seventy five degree during the day sweater weather for us. So just Goodness. just just want you to, you know, pray for our, our, our well being based upon that, you know, happening down here. Man, that so, is that is I don't know how you're gonna handle that. Yeah, you know, we're all scared. We're all I, really scared. I can imagine. So I haven't yeah. seen seventy five in thirty <laughs> days. So <laughs> Uh, they live in Florida. But, but, but for yeah. us, after you know, uh, seven months of ninety plus degrees, when you get that first shot of cooler air, yeah. for us, it is a big deal for us. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel it. it's all relative, right, Sean? It's all relative. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> all relative. All right, buddy. Let's let's talk about these markets here a little bit. Yeah. So yesterday was a uh, well, for lack of a better term, a a, a huge correction. We had. Uh, and, and you talked about it last week, and of course I'm not smart enough to catch on to what you say, but you were you were talking about it last week about how you know here in the near future, basically you were getting your your smart money sell signals uh, were coming in, and, and sure enough they came through. So just to kind of recap a little bit here, yesterday on the close, uh, December 20 corn was down 14 and a half. March 21 corn was down 12 and a quarter. November beans were down 25, and January. 21 beans were down 21 and three quarter. Um, the cattle markets had a, had a fairly good day. They were up a little bit. Uh, crude oil has struggled um, this whole week. I mean, with this, you can watch the stock market and see what's going on with crude oil. Uh, wheat, uh, there's been a lot of hard red winter wheat. There's been a lot of, uh, of rainfall um, coming in some pretty drought stricken areas. So that's kind of rebounded that a little bit. Uh, or, sorry, uh, had a negative uh, correction on that as well, so a lot of the gains that we that we had made up to that four twenty mark is have been erased down to that four dollar mark, and it looks like the overnights um, had to, haven't done really much good either. Um, we're looking at uh, looks like December corn's down three quarter, and March is down one, and then if you look at um, soybeans are up two uh in the november contract and and then the uh, january contract looks like we're up one and three quarters so corn is still uh still trying to shake off some of that some of that bearish news but if you also take a look at the stock market um hasn't been a lot of stuff going on there of positive nature either so i guess what is your reaction to all this sean and and how do you see uh trade shaping up well i mean we kind of talked about you know leading into the elections that there's likely was there was likely going to be periods of risk off trade you know, that would, where speculators just decide they want to take some of their money off the table. And because they've been buying agriculture, especially the grain markets, so, you know, aggressively here over the last several months, you know, they were all piled in uh, on the same side of the boat. And in fact, if just for example, on soybeans, the net uh, speculative position as a percentage of open interest reached a record high. So they were all in. On, and, and whenever you're all in, any little shift in, uh, in in your bullish view can cause a cascade of selling, and that's that's where our smart money sell signals started to get triggered. You know, we started we triggered the first one in soybeans, and then last week we had wheat and uh, and corn get set off, and um, and so whether it's the virus spiking, whether it's um, uh, you know, fears over uh, you know more lockdowns. Whether it's fears over the uncertainty over the election, whatever you know, the the fact that the uh, it looks like we're not going to have a stimulus bill now until after the election, and of course, you know, all this just created a a risk off trade, and that's why the stock market I think was down almost a thousand on the Dow, for yeah. example. And so, yeah. you know, when when that happens and the dollar surged, 
it, it's just everybody starts pulling their money back out. And, um, and, and so that's where we are. And we warned that, that, that we were likely set up for, and, and we're likely going to have more risk off days. And maybe today's not the day for an, an additional, but I mean, I, we think we're going to have a series of these Casey before things can get cleared up a little bit. And, 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 and we get a, a clear direction of where things really are heading for 2021. And so for now, you know, we just think markets, generally speaking, are going to be under some pressure here um, into November, and then we'll just have to see how everything plays out with the uh, with the elections. Is it contested? How how's it all go? And we just don't think this is a, a time where the speculative community is going to be pu- pu- pushing money in for a while. And so that means we probably made some tops um, that were you know. And 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 remember, South American weather does not really enter what we call mission critical time frame until mid late December onward. So weather's going to be kind of off the table for right now, you know, winter wheat's going into dormancy, some rains have come, but for whatever it means, once you go to dormancy, it's just kind of, now we're looking for some winter kill in January, February. Once again, weather's just going to be off the table here for the next 30 days. And that means the market is vulnerable to outside forces moving the markets around. Yeah. So, so before the, uh, <clears throat> Before I start recording, I start talking about, you know, what's going on with China. And, I mean, obviously, China's not going to keep coming to the table and, and just buying mountains and mountains and mountains of goods um, like they have been here of late. And especially as the uh, as the dollar strengthens. And, you know, we've seen a lot of pressure on the dollar here the last, really, 60 days. I mean, we, we've seen it down in the in the low 90s all the way up to, you know, somewhere in the mid, like, the mid-90 range as far as, as uh dollar value goes and you know as that dollar starts to creep up obviously it affects our exports so when you look at at what's going on right now with exports what are your reaction to what you see happening well the problem we always have with how people analyze markets is so for example back in the spring when the virus hit and demand got hit everyone said oh the demand's going to stay permanently down for the rest of the year and they all got bared up and they of course they they all sold along right mm-hmm. now we've had this huge increase in demand and now everyone's saying well this demand is going to continue to grow as far as i can see and, and that's just demand is never linear it has these surges and it's us we call it a sine wave we, we had this chart in our report this week we talked about the sine wave pattern of ag demand that it it's not linear now, it may be trending higher, but you're going to go through these surges and falls. And sur- So where we think we are, we have the surge in demand from China, and we think that they're going to start to end. doesn't mean they won't buy grains, but they're going to soften. They're going to slow down their purchases and kind of go down this part of the sine wave. And given how pumped up everybody is, anything that's other than what it's been is going to be bearish to the marketplace. And so we think that the market is overestimating overall Chinese demand based upon what we think is kind of a front-end loaded uh, purchasing by them, and they're going to have to scale back that demand as we move into the end of the year. That, that's really ultimately where we think the market has got it wrong short-term, is that they're, just, they're going through this linearity pattern that doesn't exist in the real world. Yeah. So we got an export report coming out this week, and as we sit back and take a look at what's going on, um, do you see anything um, shocking out there that, as far as estimates go, that might steer you to see that there's a there's going to be a slough off here in, in exports from this for this week's report anyway? I mean, you never know from one week to report, you know, what's going to happen. But we've always had this working theory um, that as we approach the election, that, that, that would be a, a period where the the Chinese would back off. And take a, a look at what's what's happening. So this could be the first week that they back off a little bit and say, look, we're just going to see what happens. Is it a landslide victory for Biden? Is it a landslide victory for Trump? Right. Or or is it a toss up and we have no idea for months? I think a lot of how they uh, gauge the political uh, uh, temperature here over the next week will have a lot to do with how they go about handling their overall purchases, how quickly they take deliveries. Remember, you can put all kinds of orders on the books you want, but the real money is when you deliver it. And so 
the Chinese have been noted for putting a lot of things on the books and deciding, well, we're gonna, we don't need that. We didn't need all those words. We're going to cancel a few. Or we're going to delay some further out. Uh, it's, it's very possible that you know they just put a lot in the books to look good, but they don't they don't have intention of taking delivery of it all. So so one really has to measure how much is on the books versus how much has been delivered and see if are we seeing a are we not delivering as fast as we should? And I think that would be the first sign that maybe they uh, they did more buying to play a good hand ahead of the elections, but maybe they don't really need all. In fact, it's almost impossible that they didn't need all this product right now. So this could be the first week we start to see some of that. Certainly, I would, I would think next week would be a week to look for, then maybe to back off the pedal a little bit and see what's going on. But uh, but I think before too long, we're going to see that export number. It's not quite over the top, and the market's going to go, oh, is that, you know, and I'm just going to start questioning whether or not they, you know, that, that, that kind of demand is going to continue going forward. And certainly improved weather in South America that we've been seeing, um, you know, the market's going to also just look, look at, at, and the Chinese look at the weather down in South America, and they're going to look at that and say, well, you know, maybe we'll hold off a little bit because if big soybean crop again down in Brazil, you know, maybe we just, maybe we bought enough for now, you know. So all, all kinds of reasons to think that, Within the next few weeks, we, we're probably going to see them pull back from exports for a little while. Okay. Right on. Okay, now let's, let's, I want to jump over and let's talk about what's going on in the uh, <clears throat> livestock markets. Cattle and hog both. Uh, Cogs have obviously had a, had a pretty good run here, you know, with a lot of exports, news going over to China, those kind of things. Cattle has kind of had a mixed trade the last couple of weeks. It uh, feels like whatever they gain one day, they, they lose the next couple. So I guess you take a look at those two marketplaces. What are some standouts to you there, and, and what are you paying attention to? What I'm paying attention to is that the hog herd um, is grow, is, has grown 30% year over year in China, and pork supply is starting in the first quarter going to be up 30% year over year. So what that means is they're going to need less pork next year right. than they needed this year. It doesn't mean they're not going to buy a lot of U.S. pork but they're not going to buy as much U.S. pork next year as they did this year. And given this, how much, how many animals we still are going to need to do something with here in the U.S., is there anyone that can replace a lot? Let, let, let's say exports drop in half, which, by the way, half of what they've been is still a phenomenal number, by the way. Right. But who who's going to make up the difference? There's no one in the world that will make up that difference. So. Our view is that this is a fi- the, the, the fourth quarter is the final buying binge from the Chinese to make sure they have enough pork for their February March holidays, and then after that, you know, we just think they're just it's once again it's going to be uh, peak demand, export demand in the fourth quarter, and it's going to be very very hard for the hog market to uh, to make headway beyond the seventy cent area that we've seen um, if if we're correct about that, and and we got a smart money sell signal in hogs this past week um everything is set up for a correction you know and and really we try to go through 70 multiple times and we keep failing and it looks like we're now rolling over to the downside here so you know we're we're just we were wildly bullish as you know in the 50 cent area over the summer but now we're, we're, we're more concerned and we do think that producers you know, should be locking in these these cash prices. We think this is going to be a good place to sell for a while. All right, Sean. So another thing I've been paying attention to as well, and or obviously there's a direct correlation between you know crude oil and what happens in the stock market. And you know, as you take a look at what's happening with crude oil right now, I mean, last night's close was thirty seven dollars and forty five cents a barrel. That was down two twelve from the day before. Opened up a little bit higher t- over in the overnights tonight, or last night, but, man, that's, that's down quite a bit from that, that mid-40 range that we've seen. There's kind of a lot of erosion there. But, again, when the stock market's down 1,000 points, 700 points, 500 points a day, crude oil is going to take that hit. So when you're looking at crude oil right now, is there still some of that, you know, just this lack of overall use of getting back to that that primary Nine million barrels a day worth of gasoline use. I mean, we're still well under that by about a million barrels on average a day. What's your thoughts there, and and, and what do you, what do you see happening in the oil market? You know, I just I just think we're we're we we had the the shock of the virus. 
we got juiced up with really, really good drugs and got everybody feeling better again. And now we're, the drugs are wearing off and we're having a sobering look at what the true nature of our economy is going forward and, ha- and, ha- and, and, and that the problems are going to be around for a while. And so, so the focus of the stock market uh, and the crude oil market is that uh, demand you know, is, is, could struggle here, especially with you know, people are now fearful of a winter surge in the virus. More lockdowns means less gasoline demand. Lack of a stimulus bill until after the elections and possible gridlock after elections means no more stimulus. Well, people are worried without stimulus, the economy could suffer greater. Um, you look, so, so when you, when you look at all of that, the market is saying that it's, it's concerned that there's too much uncertainty over future demand for crude and that you know, we may have to throttle down our price expectations and the stock market's feeling the same way because the stock market uh, is many believe that it's a measure of sentiment about the economy. So as the stock market goes, then people view it as either good or bad for the economy. And that's why crude oil is so highly correlated to the stock market. I mean, if you've put the two on top of each other and run a correlation a coefficient equation, it's an extraordinarily tight relationship between the two because uh, of, of how both are t- tend to be measuring the economy. And of course, the economy, if, if the economy is doing well, you're burning gasoline, you're burning diesel fuel. I mean, that's what make you know, you're, you're heating up, you're doing things. And, and it's a direct measure of what the real economy is doing. And I just think with all this uncertainty, the crude oil market is rolling over here. It doesn't look good. And if we're talking about things like corn, and ethanol, you know, if the crude oil market is rolling over to the low 30s, for example, that's just not good news for demand for ethanol. And, and I would worry that corn ethanol demand is going to suffer, you know, and that we could see that the strong cash basis, Casey, that we've been having in the country. You know, we could see us starting to widen now, especially if the Chinese pull back from exports. You know, we're going to get a widening of the basis on top of the futures going down. So this is just a time that. I think one has to be very careful that if you have short-term supplies of corn or soybeans or wheat that you need to sell, make sure you get it done. You know, make sure you get that cash in the bank because, you know, this could be a couple of months where you're not going to have great prices for a while. I mean, not as bad as they were in August, but I mean, it's just going to be a time where the market's going to recalibrate downward for a while. We got really, we got a really good rally, but nothing goes straight up. There's always yin and yang, zigs and zags along the way, and we're just worried that we're going to have a pretty good, you know, zig down here. And, and we wouldn't want our producers not to, we don't want them to, you know, sell the low. <laughs> right. Like, uh, yeah. like many, you know, like many did in August. You know, right. We want them to sell the high, not right. the low. Yeah. So now I hear that. Now I hear that. So let's talk about ethanol now. So you can't have that conversation in the U S about uh, crude oil, unless you're talking about throwing ethanol into the mix there as well. And, you know, ethanol's had struggles here of late. Obviously, since COVID nineteen, there's not been the rebound that we've seen. Now you throw uh, some some higher priced corn in the mix, and all of a sudden, ethanol's not nearly as attractive as it used to be. What are your thoughts about the ethanol market? Where do you see it short term? You know, I think there's some long term problems that we have to get kind of get our arms around. But short term, what's your thoughts? You know, I think we're going to see disappointing uh, ethanol uh, numbers. You know, look the. S- it's, it's kind of a delayed reaction because a lot of corn was bought cheap and you're still chopping through some of that cheap corn. And so, but once you get through the cheap corn, which we think we're going to be chopped through most of the cheap corn, let's say over the next few weeks, uh, I, I'd be worried from, let's say, late November onward that we're going to see a, a throttling back. I mean, if you look at a chart of ethanol production, you know, it had this surge and it's been sort of just chopping slightly downward and we think it, it could start to really nosedive as we move the, into the end of the year. You know, it wouldn't surprise us if, you know, three to 500 million bushels uh, of lost demand may creep into the market in the first quarter because it's not profitable and, and, and the ethanol plants just not be, maybe not shut down completely, but throttle back down because they're just, you know, they're in the business trying to make money. So we don't think the market is correctly ascertaining that aspect. Uh, we, we think they, they got, too comfortable, you know, that uh, Chinese demand was going to override everything. In reality, ethanol demand is a very key component to how our corn market's priced. And we think 
the best for now is, is has been seen, and we're we're going to be looking at some struggling numbers here. We don't think that's permanent, but we do think it could be a, a, a headwind for corn here over the next three months. Yeah. So. Some private analysts I've, I've listened to talk about uh, some various things, and, and most of them are, you know, firms that are, you know, look listen to what their customers have to say and what they have going on. So you, we had this November report coming up, going to be a very important report. We start looking at the Wazi report and what, as far as you know, what what's on hand and what what the overall uh, actual estimate is going to be. I think right now they're sitting about one seventy eight and some change, and and I've heard estimates anywhere from 172 to 174 mm-hmm. so i guess as you take a look at, at what that at average national yield on corn is what is your thoughts on that and i mean we've talked about it quite a bit on here um it being in that that sub you know 176 to 174 range what's your thoughts and now as we kind of head towards that you know harvest is getting really really close to being done in a lot of places and you're really going to start be able to paint that picture what are your thoughts on overall yields, and, and how do you think that November report is going to come out? Well, what they should do and what they actually do are two different things. True, very true. They should lower the yield lower, and there's no question in our mind the yields are much lower. You know, but but will they um, do that, or will they uh, uh, take a more moderate approach? Um, oftentimes, the USDA takes a painstakingly long time to get to the truth by making adjustments to quarterly grains and massaging acres at a later date. And, you know, I will believe if they do their job correctly, that we should see corn yields drop at least to 174, mm-hmm. um, if not lower, but I not believing they're going to do that. My belief is they'll come down a little, but they won't come down that much. So, you know, I'm thinking maybe they'll move yields down one or two bushel to the acre. Um, but I do not believe, you know, maybe may, they should move lower more than that, but I don't believe they will. I think so. I think that will be a disappointment to many who are expecting them to make a bigger adjustment here in November. I think they'll kick the can down uh, to make more, more important adjustments in the first quarter. That's my guess. Um, and, and, um, uh, so my, my belief is that they won't deliver on the current expectations. Yeah. I think they'll disappoint. What what is the uh what, why is the, why is that? Why do the way is it just the, the marketing year that they're looking at? Cuz it seems like January is always the all right, we we can forget to carry the one all the way through the year, but now we're not going to in in January or vice versa, you know, like oh we we didn't realize there was less than we thought. So, oh my God, what do we do now? Make this big correction in January. What? What? What's the mind? What's the mindset behind that? Well, the methodology of the USDA um, is always to be um, conservative, mm-hmm. methodical, um, and and a lot of the work they do is um, is, is kind of. They like to make more bold adjustments when they have what they would consider to be tangible evidence. Hard data, yeah. Hard data. And the reality is, remember, the corn yields, for example, is not volumetric. It's test weight. Test weight is how the yields actually ultimately determined is by test weight. Um, so that's why oftentimes, you know, you could say my yield monitor said whatever it is, but after you trick it down and you get it down to what the actual test weight is, it, it didn't yeah. turn out that, that way. So. Right. They don't really get a good measure of test weight until the entire crop is in the bin and they go out and do more of that hardcore agronomic work, which really doesn't yield them the kind of test weight data that that can give them the confidence on what yields really are until the first quarter. Um, And so I I think that because of that, they're, they're unwilling to make aggressive adjustments simply on volumetric analysis. They they'll make some adjustments, but they want to be they they just want to be more. I'm not saying it's right or wrong or indifferent, but that's just their way of doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and I think you know that's the now that can be a frustration to the market because ultimately there's other ways that you can kind of determine what yields really are. But their approach is you know we're just going to wait until we have preponderance of evidence in our favor, whereas you know many would say they should just be a little more bold and, and put out a pr- more bold predictions. That's just not how they handle things. Private firms could do that and do do that. Some of them are very good at it. Some of them are not, but the USDA uh, does not do that. And the big money trades the USDA. 
That's the bottom line. They don't trade Informa. They don't trade me. They trade USDA. Right. And whether whether we like it or not, <clears throat> yep. the algorithms say what they say. We're going to trade that, and that's the reality of the market. And we can argue all we want that that's rigged and it shouldn't be so, but it is. And if you're going to market your crop every year and you're going to predict markets every year, you have to be mindful of that and you have to be respectful of that uh, because our my job is not to determine how the market should operate. My job is to determine how the market does operate and within those rules, be a good price forecaster for my customers right. and for your customers. So, And we appreciate that. So there's there's a uh, – that's that's kind of what I assumed that that was going to be your answer because it was uh, definitely one of those uh, everything in the world points to it, like just like we saw last year, everything in the world pointed towards more prevent acres, and then you know they came out in October or September, whenever that was, that they came out with that. I guess there was more prevent plant than we thought last year. Well, it, <laughs> it took them a whole year to figure that out. So, <laughs> so yeah, and, 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 and then in the, in, the, in the June quarterly grains, they dropped yeah. corn uh, – uh, uh, stocks out a ton, and then in the September quarterly grain stocks, they cor- dropped corn stocks out a ton, suggesting you know the, they overestimated the crop last year. But you know, and, and of course, that's that was one of the factors that led to this pretty good rally, right? Right. Um, but you know, but they do eventually get to the truth. <laughs> yeah, no, <that's, laughs> they do eventually yeah. get there. It might take them two years, but they get there by God. They eventually get there, yeah. and 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 that's kind of. You know why you have to be practical about what the truth and reality is versus what the market will be willing to trade in a given moment in time. Everyone was right last year, but they were wrong not to sell. It had to endure. Of course, we didn't know the virus would come. It had to endure very low prices. So you just have to you know, r- remove one's ego and say, even though I know I'm right, the market's probably not going to agree with that for a while, and I need to take action today because prices are what they are. And at some point down the road, there'll be another opportunity to sell me being right, which is what we just saw in the last right. couple of months. Yep. You know. Yep. Hey, man. Well, good stuff, Sean. There's a ton of information out there, and luckily, since you and I have been doing this, there's been no lack of of information <laughs> to talk about. So there's plenty of stuff going on. Well, if 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 I'm remotely right about the next couple of year weather volatility that we're, we're going to see, mm-hmm. uh, we're going to have um, we might even do two shows a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's going to be there's going to be some crazy stuff coming down if you're like you said even half right on on what you've been yeah. talking about. So good stuff. Yeah. On that topic, uh, Sean was on a uh, a program called Real Vision, and he did a about an hour long um, Q and A with some uh, various folks and on this weather topic that he's been talking about. And he's been gracious enough to let me uh, put that back out on uh, his, that, that audio back out uh, in there. So look for that this week. I'm going to get that posted up there this week so you guys can take a listen to that. It's well worth your time to listen to what Sean has been talking about because um, Sean reached out to me at the end of uh, 2018 going into 2019 and I thought some crazy guy was talking to me the other end of the phone, and then next <laughs> lo and behold, he, he he was he was been right. So about the weather patterns that we, that we've seen so far, uh, when other folks told me it was going to be wet and typical spring, Sean was like, "No, it's going to be early and dry." And and lo and behold, it's uh it's done that, and you know, polar, all the polar vortexes and stuff like that that have come through. Um, you know, even when it was a hundred degrees here, and then two days later it was snowing. Um, he was like, "You're probably going to see some some crazy weather patterns come up that are going to be very, very warm to very, very cold weather in in a matter of just a few days." And boy, was he was he right? So, take a listen to this podcast when I get it list when I get it posted out there. Um, it's going to be well worth your while to, to listen to, and um, especially those folks that are thinking about attending the Moving Iron Summit coming up here in January 20th through 22nd in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, Sean has uh, is going to be there, and he's going to give this is going to be a, a very good precursor to what Sean's going to be talking about there in a lot more depth. So, um, Sean, I appreciate you letting me do that. Oh, anytime, Casey. I mean, this is, this is really important stuff. This is serious stuff, and those that are in the ag trade – need to be aware of it so that they can manage it better. It's, it's, um, it's really a critical time. So I, I, anything I can do to get the good word out is, and, and I'm 
really appreciate your gracious and getting it out because it's uh, it's not a it's not a um, a story that's being uh, talked much about in the media, as you know. Yeah. But it, it is going to be the biggest media story, in my opinion, over the next couple of years. And the time to take positive action proactively is now, not after the, the weather crisis is hit. Right. And that's really what we're all about is preparing for what's coming, not reacting to what's already occurred. Yep. So, yeah. So, yeah. So I think there's some, <clears throat> there's some great information out there. And, and, you know, like I said, Sean, I appreciate that. So Sean, if folks want to reach out to you and get more information about what you're doing at Hacker Financial and, and how you can, you can help producers. What's the best way to do that? Um, our website, Casey Hackett, H A C K E T T advisors.com. There's all kinds of stuff on there for people to look at, to see if we might be able to help them. Outstanding. So. Well, good stuff, Sean. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Pod- Podcast. Make sure you check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's where you're going to find the latest editions as they come out. Also, any blogs that I post will be there as well. Check out movingironllc.com. For a myriad of things, you've got my blog that are posted up there. You also have uh, editions of the podcast that are there as well, and also information about uh, what Sean's going to be doing at the Moving Iron Summit in January 20th through 22nd in Nashville, Tennessee. If you're a dealer and you want to be a part of that, hit me up. On uh, on there, there's a, a place where you can get information uh, about what's going on, or if you just want some just general information, hit me up at Moving Iron Podcast at movingironpodcast dot com, and I'll be sure to get back to you with all the latest information about what's going on. Check out the Global Ag Network and the great podcasters out there. The Dryline Farmer Podcast is my favorite one out there. Two Brent and Landon guys are are, uh, are uh, funny; they'll make you laugh, and uh, with their uh, off the wall antics. So check them out on on there and you're when you're in your pickup or out in the combine or whatever you might be doing so with that i am casey seymour with sean hackett let's go move some iron folks out See